more than likely you will see at least one your exam, and uh, most of the time it's a fault of liver lesion. However, occasionally they'll put in some diffuse liver diseases. So we'll spend most of our time looking at the vocal lesions. And uh, the breakdown is something like this. We'll talk about a little bit about cysts as well as abscesses, uh, trauma, and several primary liver tumors, but more common ones, particularly which is our FNH, hemangiomas, the polycytic adenomas, and polycytic carcinomas. And then we'll talk about a few diffuse diseases, including liver, uh, iron, and fat deposition, cirrhosis, diakinus, alpha obstruction, and we'll finish with this point. Everything I'm going to tell you is in the handout. And basically what we're going to do in this time frame is look at a lot of cases. And I think that if you can predictably predict, you can recognize the vocal lesions, that they will be in pretty good shape. Cysts are predominantly congenital, and they basically arise from the bile ducts epithelium. And there is an interesting uh, autosomal dominant variety called polycystic liver disease, which is different from polycystic kidney disease, in that about uh, half of the patients have renal cysts, but they don't look like polycystic kidney disease in that they're discrete and not quite as multiple and quite as large. And even if you have near complete replacement of the entire liver by cysts, they almost always have normal liver function tests as well as normal renal function. So they're quite distinct from those of polycystic uh, kidney disease. There are some acquired cysts, per parasitic or the kind of cockle cyst, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. Uh, Post-traumatic hematomas, particularly those that are post-operative or biolomas, particularly after a cholecystectomy. If they have uh, some, some kind of effect process upstream to the venous system, you often have hygienic abscesses. And then I'll show you some examples of cystic metastases later. This is a simple cyst. We all know that uh, what these look like. They're very well circumscribed in water evaluation. We don't spend as much time trying to differentiate these in the liver like we do in the kidneys because cystic malignancies are pretty uncommon in the liver as opposed to cystic renal cells. Here's an animation with an MR that had a metastatic lesion heterogeneous, much lower signal intensity than these two cysts here more immediately. And clearly you wouldn't have any difficulty differentiating between the two. This here is a case of polycystic liver disease. There is some intervening normal parenchyma here. Furthermore, some of these have calcifications within the septations. But then again, these patients normally have a, a good hepatic function, even if they have very complete replacement of the organ, and about half of renal cysts. Abscesses are more pyogenic, and many of them have some sores, such as their biliary cause, such as biliary obstruction. Some of them arise in the liver hematogenous sores from several vials. I'll show you a nice case of septic portal vein thrombosis. It can also occur in trauma in their hypercoagulable states. Fungal infections tend to occur mostly in patients that are immunocompromised. And they tend to be small, multiple lesions, typically in both the liver and the spleen, as you might expect. And parasitic infection is not terribly common in this uh, uh, country, but every now and then we'll see amoebic abscesses, which are often multi are unilocular, but can be multilocular. And the conococcal cysts, most of the ones we see in this country are the multilocularis uh, variety. And the, the appearance of these are somewhat multilocular. They tend to have these enhancing areas so peripherally they tend to have enhancing septations, and often the parenchyma around them is somewhat hypodense and poorly enhancing. Here's an MR again, a complicated, uh, kind of a hyper-enhancing peripheral mass, but these liquefied areas centrally. And I think we probably think of abscess last, the temptation to think of some kind of uh, unusual tumor like biliary cyst adenoma, or perhaps a malignancy, but think of abscess. Now notice in this particular patient, the right portal vein is thrombosed, also the thrombosis of the left portal vein, and peripheral to that, those little areas of liquefaction, this is septic portal vein thrombosis with multiple liver at peripheral. Anytime you see portal vein thrombosis, you need to look upstream to see if there's something going on, perhaps particulitis, appendicitis, or some other inflammatory process within the mesenteric venous drainage. Here's a locular cyst, and this one has somewhat of a thick literally. And this is a Abscess, although they can be unilocular, this is a, an example of just a, a, a kind of cause that's relatively simple. And then here's another one, not simple at all. It has some areas of lots of septations, has some areas of high density. And this particular lesion, however, looked very much like a biliary cyst adenoma. I always tell our residents that biliary cyst adenoma is like multilocular cystic nephromas do in the kidney. It's a very similar appearance, well circumscribed with multiple loculations and compartmentalization within them. This is more typical for a kind of cockle cyst where you see them peeling away from the wall here and kind of falling in within the, within the cyst like a little mini sign in the rough breast implant. Sometimes these communicate with biliary tree because they fill their dilation and obstruction as well as debris. And when we ablate these, we often, when we have that, that occurs not because we will not ablate it. 
likely to communicate with the biliary tree. Uh, in terms of trauma, well, there's lots of different terms we can use which are well acquainted with contusion, bruise, <coughs> linear lacerations or fractures, and then subcapsular repair of hematomas. In patients that come in that are hypotensive, they tend to get a lot of fluids to try to restore their blood pressure. If they get saline, they don't get the protonaceous substances within their fluids. And these crystalloids tend to give them low oncotic pressure. You can get pericortal low edema or pericortal low attenuation, a ring-like sign around the portal veins. You can see that with any cause of pericortal, uh, any cause of lymphedema, whether the patient has a liver transplant or they cut the lymphatics, or in patients that are hypoalbuminemic for whatever cause. Now, I don't particularly, I don't use the grading systems for trauma, and I don't even know them, to be honest with you. If the examiner asks you what the grading system is, tell them, in all honesty, that, that we're not taught those because there's no correlation between the grading systems and the treatment that patients are treated by their symptoms, not according to the CT scan. So I don't advocate that we actually uh, use that grading system for either the liver or the spleen. Here's the linear laceration to the left hepatic lobe. This injury, however, is much less so severe than the transverse fracture to the neck of the pancreas. And the reason for that is the duct is disrupted, so the enzymes that are being produced by a large amount of vital tissue upstream basically have nowhere to go. And these patients almost uniformly need to have a, a, a pancreatic adjacentostomy at some point down the line. So liver injury, not so bad. A pancreatic injury, very bad. Here's a perihepatic or subcapsular hematoma. It's not always easy to tell, as well as a laceration with the right hepatic lobe. Now, notice this particular patient has a large wedge-shaped area of hypoperfusion. That doesn't mean that that portion of the liver is necessarily non-viable. I've seen cases like that within a year, within a couple of weeks, actually reperfuse that portion. Perhaps they have a non-occlusive thrombus, or they have like a ball valve in the portal vein, something like that can give you reperfusion. Sometimes just vasodilatation following the correction of hypovolemia can do that as well. All right, let's talk about some focal lesions. First of all, the mangiomas. There are probably uh, perhaps 100 hemangiomas in the room. They're about that common. About 10 to 15% of individuals have those. And there are multiple about 15 to 25% of the time more common in females, as you know. Now, as we go through the focal lesions, I'm going to emphasize the histology behind these. Because if you can remember the histology, and they're relatively simple, then you can often predict what they will look like with various imaging modalities. The pathology with the hemangioma is basically a tangle. Every word is important. That's a thin wall endothelial line channel. There's very little intervening or interstitial space. It's just most of these little channels. That explains why they do look like they do with ultrasound and the CT and MR. Now when they're very large, the, slow, the flow within these is so slow, the flow coming from the periphery, from the hepatic artery, that you can actually get thrombosis of the vessel centrally, and over time that can form a hyaline scar. And that portion of the tumor will never be classical in terms of its imaging features. They're not encapsulated, although they can have a pseudo-capsule of compressed normal a surrounding non-tumorous parenchyma. And as I mentioned, they get their blood supply from the periphery, which is real important, from the hepatic artery. Now, they're very echogenic because they basically have all these interfaces within these endothelial light channels. Furthermore, about 60% of them will demonstrate this uh, finding of posterior acoustical enhancement. Because even though they're echogenic, they don't really absorb much of the sound beam, so they can have through transmission. Now, on CT, the most important finding is look for this peripheral nodular enhancement. Not just peripheral enhancement, I mean nodular in the form of a cotton wool or little cotton balls at the periphery. And over time, these get larger. But again, the flow is relatively slow. This has a central scar. This portion of the tumor may not fill in for a couple of weeks because it just doesn't have that much perfusion to it. One other thing, notice that the density of these can actually be exceed that of the aorta because there's very little equilibrium occurring here with these small molecular extracellular extra extra contrast agents that we use. They, they interfuse, they inter disperse within the extracellular space uh, in the liver, but they don't do that in hemangiomas because there's very little extracellular fluid. With uh, MR, they tend to be hypointense on T1, which doesn't really help. Here's a scar that's also hypointense. And here's the out of phase. It doesn't really look any different because they don't contain fat. And here's a T2 where they're homogeneously high signal intensity, similar to that of the gallbladder or the CSF fluid, more than the spleen or the kidney, and very well circumscribed. Again, if they have a central scar, that area will be hypointense. And then because gadolinium is also a small molecular weight uh, extracellular contrast agent, they also have the same imaging features with iodine, peripheral or nodular enhancement that gets larger over time, as you can see in this particular case. All right, focal nodular hyperplasia. 
These are not really that uncommon, it's just in the past we didn't do a very good job of finding them. But now with dual phase imaging, we find them very frequently. They're much more common in females. However, they're really of no clinical significance. They're not free malignant. They're not associated with oral contraceptives. They don't, they're not associated with spontaneous hemorrhage. Now, what do they contain pathologically? Well, they contain normal functioning hepatocytes. They contain bile duct epithelium. And they're the only ones of these hepatocyte-containing lesions with the exception of regenerating nodules that do contain bile duct epithelium. As you'll see later, adenomas and carcinomas do not contain bile duct epithelium. That's important when you biopsy them to look for the bile ducts. They also contain Kupfer cells to a relatively high degree. Every lesion that we're going to talk about, including hemangiomas, regenerative nodules, HCC, adenomas, and FNH, all contain Kupfer cells. Make no bones about it. The key thing is how much Kupfer cell activity they have. Regenerative nodules are probably pretty much normal liver, so they have a lot of Kupfer cell activity. And vocal nodular hyperplasia, about 60% of those have high Kupfer cell activity as well, whereas all the other lesions, adenomas and carcinomas, have very low Kupfer cell activity. They often have a central scar, but they're not the only thing that can have a scar, it's about 50%. They are not encapsulated, they do not contain internal fat like adenomas and carcinomas, and they get their blood supply to the center of the lesion, not the port, but the center of the lesion where the scar is from the hepatic artery. Sometimes they're hypoechoic, like this lesion here, and sometimes they're isoechoic and not visible at all. Now this particular lesion, you might think that it's actually completely invisible in the portal venous phase, but you see no blood vessels here in the left hepatic lobe. So in the arterial phase, you can see that there's a vividly enhancing lesion. And they almost all vividly enhance like this during the hepatic arterial phase. Here's another lesion. Now many of them look like small boutonnieres, like a little carnation that men wear in the lapels of a wedding. And you can see that they hyper-enhance have somewhat globulated appearance. And all you see in the venous phase in this particular case is the subtle error to hyper-enhance it, but the scar. I say this several times as we go through the talk. Artist tissue in general in the liver behaves as follows. It enhances slowly, and it washes out slowly. So in the arterial phase, it won't enhance much. In the portal venous phase, it may not enhance much. But in the equilibrium phase, it may hang on to the contrast material longer than the tumor and actually have delayed washout. And we see that fibrous phenomenon not only in the central scar in a patient with a focal nodular hyperplasia, we also see it in the capsule of an HCC or an adenoma. We also see it in, um, in the parenchyma in patients with cirrhosis. HCCs walk out, wash out more quickly than the fibrous parenchyma in cirrhosis. We'll go through this over and over again. Where's that? Where's this particular case? Here we see the central scar again here, but we don't see the lesion in the venous phase. Here's the MR, not well seen on T1. They're the stealth lesions, not well seen out of phase. Suddenly hyper intense on this, and often they're invisible on T2 as well. The scar is, except is slightly hyper intense, sometimes that's helpful. <coughs> Vividly enhanced in the arterial phase, except for the scar, which enhances slowly, and then the venous phase, including the scar enhanced. Remember, the scar is more slow. Nuclear medicine, about 60% of them will show uniform or increased activity with sulfur collar, again because of the Cooper cell activity. And here's, we saw this case earlier, notice we see nice uh, activity within the left hepatic lobe corresponding to that lesion. All right, next is adenomas. These really are rare tumors. We probably see a handful of these a year, as opposed to FH, where we see malt, many of them a year. They're definitely much females than in males. And they are considered to be bad tumors. They're either pre-malignant or can be frankly, frankly malignant. And they are pretty much resected by hepatic surgeons. There is believed to be an association. This is something controversial with oral contraceptives. And uh, you have to be on them for a few years. You can't do it for, probably it takes at least five years to increase your, the association. And about 20 to 30 percent of patients will present with spontaneous. And the surgeons will look at the tumors and decide whether they're deep or subcaptive. Those that are deep, are less of a risk of spontaneous hemorrhage into the perineal cavity, in other words, are less life threatening than those that are subcapsular, which can spontaneously burst into, into the perineal cavity and potentially. So, what do they have um, pathologically? Well, they have normally functioning hepatocytes like FNH, but they have very low Cooper cell activity, much less than FNH. They often have a fibrous capsule, about a third to a half. They can have a central scar. They often have internal fat and they often have areas of hemorrhage, or actually hematomas, a lot of times, particularly when they present with symptoms. They also get their blood supply at the center of the lesion from the hepatic artery. 
And here's a large, ugly tumor. Notice there's a decentric clot. We see this again mostly in females, so now we'll see in a male, particularly those males that are on androgen, these bodybuilders that take androgen. So what we always say is the good news is that you're buff, the bad news is you have a tumor that only girls get. <laughs> I notice on the ultrasound that they can look like anything, so it really doesn't help at all. Um, here's one where pre-contrast, you can see the tumor, but basically the hematoma makes it much easier to see as it's hyperdense as you'd expect. Notice the hematoma is not quite so obvious post-contrast. Also, there's a very thin, a thin capsule here peripherally at the, along the posterior medial aspect of it, which is typical for both adenomas and HCC. The capsule is very thin, only a couple millimeters in thickness, but discontinuous and doesn't have to go all the way around. This is one of my favorite cases because in the arterial phase, there's hyperenhematic, and there's two foci or globules of blood at the periphery. There's also a central scar with a blood vessel in it, which is typical. But notice in the venous phase, now we see the fat globules as well as a, as a capsule. So this basically, in this particular patient who's a young female, is pretty classic for a palisader adenoma. Obviously, if it's a cirrhotic patient, that's why I tell the residents in our program, the first thing you do when you get a case number is try to figure out whether the patient's a cirrhotic or not. If it's a cirrhotic patient, it's an HCC until proven otherwise. Yeah, you could have a dysplastic nodule or a regenerative nodule, but anything that hyper-enhances, consider that an HCC until proven otherwise. Anything that has a capsule, thing, think of an HCC until proven otherwise. And so keep in mind also that mets are extremely rare in patients with cirrhosis. And hemangiomas are quite rare in, in uh, cirrhosis. So that's why it's safe to say HCC until proven otherwise. Now remember that some patients have uh, inherited diseases such as glycogen storage disease, type 1, where they have an increased incidence of adenosine. Glycogen is the number one reason why the liver is the densest organ in the abdomen and makes it uh, go out very dense. So why is it the liver is not dense with glycogen storage disease? And the reason is it's a metabolic and they have a predominance of fat within the liver. So they actually have low density livers rather than high density livers. But they all have big livers. So the, the key finding is big fatty livers and with a bunch of focal lesions. Here's one that's hemorrhagic. Here's an hepatic globe. Here's one that has thin it. Or perhaps some old hemorrhage. Here's another hemorrhagic lesion. Here's one here. Notice post contrast now. Here's one that's hyper enhancing. Here's one that has fat in it, the other ones are a little less apparent. And here it is in the venous phase again. This one is large and encapsulated. This one's a little bit less difficult, to see, less uh, easy to see. So big fatty livers with multiple lesions think of uh, glycogen storage disease. Other hemp on the MR, they're really easy because they have blood products of high intensity and high intensity on T2. But in the absence of hemorrhage, it can be quite difficult because they can look either like normal liver or more likely they'll look like a metastasis or any other lesion. Hypo intense on one and hyper intense on T2. So in the absence of hemorrhage, it's difficult to make the diagnosis. All right, what about HCC? Well, these are much more common in men, and 70% of the time they have cirrhosis. The flip side of the coin is if you have cirrhosis, there's a better chance of developing HCC. It's about 5 to 10%. The alpha feeder protein is mainly increased in those in those patients of tumors, increased in about 60 to 75%, and it's a small tumor that typically negative, and remember the patients with viral and other HCC also tend to have negative AFP. Now what do they, they often have many of the same features as adenomas. They're just occurring more often in cirrhotics. They have internal fat. They have areas of fibrosis central. They have areas of hemorrhage, although you don't tend to see blood eccentrically like you do with an adenoma. Third to a half of a, of a fibrous capsule, again about two to three millimeters in thickness, and often discontinuous. And they're very invasive locally, which is not, is not the case with adenomas. They can invade and obstruct the portal veins and give you malignant portal vein thrombosis. They can also give you bland portal vein thrombosis. They can invade the hepatic veins and extend into the heart. And that's one of the reasons why the number one metastatic site from HCC is, as you'd expect, lungs to the next to the pulmonary capillary bed. They can also invade the bile ducts. We think about cholangiac carcinoma when we see that. Remember, uh, bile duct invasion occurs in HCC as well. These two also get their blood supply from the hepatic arteries, but not necessarily the central. They can get central or peripheral, and that uh, somewhat varies from patient to patient. Here's a patient that we thought had carcinoma because of the fact that there was tumor in the gallbladder fossa. This is actually a large ACC invading the gallbladder, although keep in mind the gallbladder carcinomas typically invade the liver, so this could be either. Remember, most of the patients with gallbladder carcinoma at the time of presentation have either direct invasion of the liver or intrahepatic metastases. Here's a nice case, cirrhotic liver clearly, nodular liver, big spleen, evidence of cirrhosis with the portal hypertension. Notice the tumor is invaded the portal vein, the left portal vein, and is also invaded.
made of the hepatic vein and is extending up into the IVC. This is a, with an encapsulated <coughs> node, it's a thin capsule, fully a cirrhotic. This is obstructing the wild ducts here. So think of that, not just think of cholangio when you see a wild duct invasion. This is a non cirrhotic so that these tend to be, the tumors tend to be a little bit better differentiated off when we see that there's functioning hepatocytes free contrast, so they have glycogen just like the normal liver. Now this is not all capsule. Often rapidly expanding HCCs in a non cirrhotic patient, in other words, a hard tumor in a soft liver, they can give you a pseudo capsule. Here, it's a, here we see this uh, capsule is this thin thing here at the periphery, but then there's a pseudo capsule peripheral to it, basically compressed, poorly functioning non tumorous parenchyma. And here's the MR in that patient, and we see that that non tumorous parenchyma doesn't have as much function, so it doesn't have the same signal intensity characteristics. Now notice on the T2 that there's a double line. We see a big scar here that's hyper intense. But notice if you blow that up, that there's two white lines. This is the capsule, and then peripheral to it is an edematous pseudocapsule that's also of high signal intensity on the T2-weighted images. Notice this tumor seen well in the arterial phase, clearly a cirrhotic. Very difficult to see in the venous phase. It's important to have arterial imaging. Here's a tumor in the left, in the right portal vein, hyper enhancing. This is malignant vein thrombosis much more difficult to make that diagnosis in the 40s phase. Here's a late lesion that lights up in the arterial phase. Remember what I said about capsule, it's fibrous in nature, so the capsule does not enhance in the arterial phase, but notice in the venous phase, it's in hyper, there is some wash in, and it's hyper-enhancing relative to the tumor itself. Here's a tumor on a T1-weighted image that's hyper-intense, and then on the outer phase, it drops out. So remember, two fatty tumors occur in the liver. Don't think about lipomas. Lipomas are extremely rare in the liver. You can put that in your differential, but put it way down the list. Metastatic liposarcoma, you can put that in your differential. It's much, much less common. But I think if you see fatty tumor is, first of all, HCC, you know, if it's a young female, think of hepatocyte or adenomas. So this one drops out. Here's a T2, very difficult to see. There's some subtle hyperintensity here centrally. The scar tends to be hyperintense there, peripherally. Here's the arterial phase that lights up vividly. And then over time, you can see it fill in, but the capsule accumulates contrast. Again, farmers lesions tend to do that. So there's a little bit of information about uh, cirrhotic versus non cirrhotic HCCs. And the main thing to remember that in cirrhotic patients, they're much more commonly multifocal. And they're usually more commonly multi solitary in the non cirrhotic population. That makes sense because the liver is not a hotbed for the development of HCCs. That's the main difference except for perhaps the scar here. So that's the main thing, <coughs> typically solitary. Now this, most of those uh, solitary, most of those patients that have no evidence of cirrhosis have a solitary lesion, and some of them, although not the majority, the bar fibro and l cc this is an example of that. They're typically uh, well encapsulated lesions, as you can see here, this is a very nice capsule here, posteriorly and interiorly. They tend to have somewhat of a spoke configuration. They tend to have a large central scar. Now, so in summary, about the different histologic composition, so notice we're generating nodules, we'll talk about that in a minute. Focal nodules are hyperplasia, adenomas and carcinomas, they all contain hepatocytes of various degree of differentiation. Only regenerating nodules in FNH have bile duct epithelium. They all have Cooper cells, high in focal nodules are hyperplasia, but low in adenomas and carcinomas. And adenomas and carcinomas tend to be encapsulated. They tend to have fat, they tend to have internal hemorrhage, but not the eccentric hematoma that you see with the abnormal, and anything can have a central scar. All right, let's go through some differentials. These are in your handout. First of all, for hypervascular metastases, these are typically the endocrine tumors like carcinoid, islet cell, pheochromocytoma, thyroid, and you can throw some others in there like renal cell carcinoma. I put a question mark by breast carcinoma and melanoma because studies have shown that they're infrequently hypervascular, probably less than 5% of the time. Here's a carcinoid tumor in multiple hypodense lesions, pre-contrast. Many of them hyper-enhanced in the arterial phase, but not all of them, and some of them will disappear in the venous phase. Differential for cystic metastases. These are typically tumors that undergo necrosis. They're not, they're not really cystic by, by nature, although some ovarian mucin-producing tumors can form a cystic malignancy as well. Most of them are cystic because of necrosis. So ovarian carcinoma, small cell lung carcinoma, uh, Carporeo carcinoma, endometrial, and the and carcinoid, uh, or gastric carcinoma. The sarcomas, or the spindle cell tumors, are the ones that tend to get the most attention in terms of cystic metastases. 
Now, cystic metastases don't typically look like simple cysts. They tend to have a mural nodule like this one here has, or, I'm sorry, mural nodule. They just tend to have a fluid debris level, like you see here, or they have a thick line. So they have features that say, hey, this is not just a simple cyst, this is something else. All right, what about calcified metastases? They tend to be mucinous tumors of the ovary, the colorectal uh, carcinomas, gastric carcinomas, and occasionally, but not very common, breast carcinomas. And here's one that has central calcifications. The calcifications can be central or peripheral. And even if you don't do unenhanced CT routinely, you can typically see the calcifications because they tend to be clumped together and be more, um, more uh, confluent in that particular case. Now here's an example of a, of a mucinous a tumor, a very large mucin-producing tumor. I wanted to throw this in because these tend to be cold on a PET scan. Here it is post-contrast. No one would miss this tumor. And notice here's the PET scan with attenuation correction. There's no increased activity at all. I'm not sure exactly why this occurs. Probably has something to do with the fact that perhaps the, um, the FDG accumulation is dispersed by all this mucin and mucin producing material. So again, they can be uh, cold and one of the false negatives for the PET. All right, what about the differential for hyperintensive lesions on a T1-weighted image? I've already showed you an example of a fatty metamorphosis in the pyrocytor adenomas and HCC. You can also get it with melanoma because of the iron-producing products or the shortening of T1. Hemorrhagic tumors such as adenomas or carcinomas that have focal hemorrhage. There are some hemorrhagic metastases that are pretty rare. And sometimes cysts because of proteinaceous material or hemorrhage, say a trauma, a trivial trauma, they can have high intensity as well. This is an example of an in-phase and out-phase in a patient with melanoma metastases. Notice they're of high signal intensity, multiple of them on T1, although this particular lesion, for some reason, perhaps it doesn't have much in the way of melanin, is not hyper-intense. The liver drops out because of there's some fat in it on the out of phase. Notice the ones that are hyper-intense tend to have T2 shortening as well, so they may not be hyper-intense on T2. This one that did not have melanin it is hyper-intense on the T2, and often they will hyper-enhance because they're vascular during the arterial phase of the millennium. What about the differential for the light bulb sign? Well, most of these are hemangiomas, and you can also see that cysts occasionally with hypervascular metastases. Usually the parameters we choose, say, echo times, particularly for the old conventional, we don't do these anymore, but there's not that much uh, high, uh, overlap between that and hemangiomas. And uh, usually the enhancement pattern is quite thin. Again, peripheral nodular enhancement with hemangiomas, more uniform enhancement with hypervascular metastases. <laughs> And here's a very well circumscribed, hyper intense lesion. This is a natural one. What about ring lesions? Well, these occur on occasion. Some of them are hyper hematomas, which are resolving, so they have various layers of citron and, and, and uh, those other blood products. HCC can be ringed because of the capsule, and that's true of adenomas as well. Some metastases will be ringed, particularly from endocrine tumors and some inflammatory cysts. Again, they have a thick rind. I already showed you an example of that. This is metastatic thyroid carcinoma. Notice that there's hyperenhancement around the periphery, which is basically some vital tissue around the necrotic focus centrally. All right, I wanted to look at some diffuse diseases. First of all, cirrhosis. Basically, what happens is that there's some repeated insult. And there's a wide variety of insults. It can be chemical, like alcohol, and this could be the most common is hepatitis C. Hepatitis B is much more common in the Orient, and is the most common cause worldwide, but in this country, it's much less common in hepatitis C. There's three to four million Americans in this country with Hep C, and they will be getting, will be having a lot of patients with HCC over the next several years, as there's about a 10-year latency period between the onset to when they actually develop HCCs. Some drugs can do it. Primary hemochromatosis, that's iron deposition within the hepatocytes, not within the particular endothelial cells, as is seen with uh, transfusional hemocytorosis. Well, what do we look for? Well, it tends to be a hallmark is nodular regeneration surrounded by a thin or thick band of fibrous tissue. And the parenchymal findings that we look for, we look for focal fat. We often see fat in, in a cirrhotic liver. It tends to be fat nodules, although it can be coalescent in the form of confluent hepatic fibrosis. I'll show you an example of that. And you can see the right nodules. Some of them will contain iron, which will be bright on an unenhanced CT, and will also have some findings on MR, which I'll show you. And then there's all the ancillary findings and of uh, portal hypertension and varices, et cetera. Well, one other thing, they often get portal vein thrombosis because of slow flow, and they often have lymphadenopathy. 
And over half of patients with cirrhosis have lymph adenopathy, even up to two centimeters in the port. I have it in the port paraduodenal region, most commonly in those inflammatory disorders, such as hepatitis C or in primary sclerosing colitis. Here's an unenhanced CT. Notice this particular regenerating nodule. It's a little bit bright because of iron, and then there's a low density rim because of fibrous tissue surrounding it. In this particular case, the fibrous tissue is relatively thick. Notice that, that on the arterial phase, you can maintain, continue to see that fibrous band again because it enhances slowly. We talked about that already. And then it fills in in the portal venous phase and the equilibrium phases. Here's a T1. Now, you can see all these dark dots on a T2 weighted image. They tend to be iron containing regenerative nodules. They're very small, although anything more than three millimeters is considered a macro regenerative nodule. Notice radiant echo in and out of phase. You can see them as well because there's some susceptibility with the presence of iron within those nodules. Not all regenerative nodules contain iron, however, and you may not see them in the MR. This is confluent hepatic fibrosis. This is a big, thick scar. It tends to be in the middle of the liver involving either the anterior right or the medial left. There tends to be atrophy associated with it because basically the parenchyma, which should come out here, shrinks down. And it's hypo-intense pre-contrast, like other, well, other fibrous tissue. Notice it doesn't enhance much in the arterial phase. This is getting redundant, guys, so you remember this now. Starting with the venous phase, and notice in the equilibrium phase, it washes out more slowly than the surrounding hepatic parenchyma. That's confluent hepatic fibrosis. And there are often cases of, several cases of the board, so I know I sent a bunch of them in. This is the T1 that shows hypo-intensity here on the T1 weighted image, like fibrous tissue. On the T2, it tends to be hyper-intense, unlike the, like the ligaments and tendons, which are hypo-intense on T2 weighted images because of the presence of, well, probably edema within these. So you say, how do you tell between tumor? Well, it can be difficult. You have to look for the atrophy, you have to look for the wedge shape appearance, and you have to look for the location, typically in the middle of the liver. All right, what about fat deposition? This is relatively common. It occurs from a wide variety of metabolic causes, endogenous or exogenous obesity, some toxic agents, particularly chemotherapeutic agents, and anything that will give you malnutrition. And the patterns are typically diffuse. You've seen those. Low bar, which is an entire segment, or more than one segment, or focal, and the focal ones tend to occur in relatively common areas. And they're relatively similar in that they tend to occur around the falciform ligament in the area here, periligamentous, around the hilum, which is I call perihylar, around the gallbladder, which I call pericholocystic, or in the subcapsular space. And these tend to occur because of apparent drainage, particularly the first three. There are aberrant veins that drain directly in the liver, and that part of the liver gets no blood supply from the portal vein. So because they have a different venous supply, they can have a different metabolic environment, and you can either see vocal deposition of fat within these areas, or vocal sparing and otherwise diffuse fat. Here's an area of periligamentous. It can be on both sides or on one side. This is the one that's the most common that you're most acquainted with. Here's an example of diffuse fatty liver with sparing here about the hilum called the segment 4B. And here's another case where there's a vocal deposition in the inferior portion of the segment 3 or the left hepatic lobe, as well as within the caudate lobe. Both of these have hypo-intensity or hypodensity due to fat deposition in the perihylar region. Here's a, an MR T1 weighted image. There's an area of hypo-intensity here in front of the ligament of venosum. On the outer phase, that's the only part that doesn't drop out. So that's the focal steering that I talked about earlier in the perihylar region. All right, I mentioned earlier about iron deposition. I really encourage you to think of as iron deposit either within the hepatocytes or within the reticular endothelial cells. And it's a very different disease process. But the hepatocyte deposition typically occurs in primary hemochromatosis, whereby there's an inherited disorder that causes too much iron to be absorbed by the gastrointestinal mucosa, particularly the small bowel. And that's within the hepatocytes. And hepatocyte deposition is believed to be toxic. So as a result of that, hepatocyte deposition is associated with the development of HCC. Cirrhosis can also give you a hepatocyte deposition. I already talked about iron-containing regenerative nodules, which are uncommon, which, which, but they can be a problem, and have believed to have a higher association with HCC. Also, intravascular hemolysis. Now, with transfusional hemocytorosis, they tend to get hundreds of blood, blood transfusions. And basically, the liver is breaking down all these old blood cells, and they're being phagocytized by the reticular endothelial cells of both the liver and spleen. So what you tend to get is, is uh, sparing of the pancreas with transfusional hemocytorosis and sparing of the spleen with hemochromatosis. Having said that, however, 
it is possible to have crossover deposition patterns in patients that have severe deposition. In other words, I've seen pancreatic involvement with primary hemochromatosis, and I've seen uh, splenic involvement with uh, patients with primary hemochromatosis. So there are some long-term sequelae associated with primary hemochromatosis, cardiomyopathies in the heart, HCC in the liver, and the bronze diabetics that occur in pancreatic deposition. Here's a very dense liver and spleen. I typically use plus 80 as my cutoff for uh, the, the, uh, the density of the liver. Notice the spleen is also very dense in this patient with transfusional hemocirrhosis. Here's a patient with primary hemochromatosis. Notice a very black liver on this T1 weighted image. I'm sorry, T2 weighted image. Actually, it's T1. It's kind of hard to tell. Isn't it? The um, notice of pancreas is also hyper. Also, also hypo-intense. But as I mentioned, the spleen is pretty much spared, but there are both hypo-intense foci, and that's primarily because this is such, the, such severe deposition of iron. All right. Now, let's talk about some differentials for diffuse liver disease. First of all, differential for hyper-attenuating liver. We already talked about iron deposition. Well, the normal, uh, by the way, the normal liver attenuation is about plus plus 55 to plus 65 pounds field units. And that's a good number to remember. Some chemotherapy will do, but particularly uh, uh, some of the, there's some gold therapy, amiodarone, which is basically iodine. Uh, we don't see many cases of thoracrass anymore because most of them have died off since it's uh, started, was quit, uh, quit using it in the 50s. And glycogen storage disease, as I already mentioned, typically gives you not a hyperdense liver, but a large fatty liver. So that would be uncommon to have in dense liver. This is one of those few remaining cases of uh, thoracrast. It was a alpha emitter that basically was given for carotid for angiography. It was taken up by the reticular endothelial cells that drop the phagocytides. That way, that's why you get this kind of reticular pattern. And notice there's a small, basically autoinfarcted spleen as well. They had a very high incidence of not only angiosarcomas, but also hepatocellular carcinomas, perhaps even more common than angiosarcomas. Part of hepatic venous obstruction, this is important to remember because it can, can occur from a variety of sources. First of all, if the venules are obstructed, we call that hepatic venal occlusive disease. But let me say this very clearly. There are no radiographic, reliable radiographic signs of hepatic venal occlusive disease because the, the, the definition of VOD is progressive non-thrombotic occlusion of hepatic venules, all right? So it's not a radiographic diagnosis, a biopsy diagnosis. If the large hepatic veins or superhepatic IBC is obstructed, we call that by PR syndrome. It doesn't have to involve all three hepatic veins. It can involve one or the other. And it can not involve the hepatic veins at all. It simply involves the superhepatic IBC. You can also see similar findings in right-sided congestive heart failure, which we call acid congestion. But by PR, it's a relatively rare entity, although it tends to pop up in the exams. Most of the cases in this country is, are idiopathic, about two-thirds. Although in the Orient, they commonly have these webs which are congenital. You can see it in patients with trauma, with thrombosis, pregnancy, oral contraceptives. And I've already showed you a case of a patient with a uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and a map to the HCC. I've also seen renal cell carcinoma with a map to the IBC, get butt PRI syndrome. Here's a clot in the hepatic vein. Most of the time with the chronic butt PRI, we don't see the hepatic veins at all. They're just small vessels that are invisible. But in acute, we can see these non-occlusive thrombi. Here's a chronic one that has all these collaterals because the blood has to get out of the liver some way. It typically goes and shunts either from one hepatic vein that's abnormal to one that's not abnormal, hepatic, hepatic vein to hepatic vein shunting. It goes from the hepatic vein in the liver to the hepatic vein in the cauda. Well, remember, the cauda has its own hepatic vein. Now it can go from the hepatic vein to the portal vein. And because of that, that portal vein is shunted. They tend to get reversal of flow in the portal vein. Makes sense. And they often get portal vein thrombosis. About 20 to 25 percent of patients with bud PR develop portal vein thrombosis. Notice the collaterals with Doppler to the hepatic veins and the caudate flow. And here's a normal tribasic flow pattern in the, in the hepatic vein. This is my own hepatic vein, fortunately normal. And this is a bud PR. Notice this one's open, but notice that there's not a tribasic pattern. It's markedly dampened by the, whatever web I can see here in the hepatic vein. This is a very nice case of IPRI. Notice that we see clots in the hepatic veins here. We see that the, the periphery of the liver is hypodense. And notice the blood can get into the portal veins, it just can't get out. And it's the periphery of the liver that's drained by the hepatic veins. So anytime you see that central 
peripheral differentiation, think of that yard. You also want to throw in primary sclerosing cholangitis in the differential, which tends to involve the peripheral small bile ducts more commonly than the central ones. Here's a, here it is again, a little bit lower again, peripheral central differentiation. And here it is lower. Notice that this patient also has oral vein thrombosis and early cavernous transformations. So remember, 20% of the time, patients with bite chiari also get portal vein thrombosis, and they often have ascites. Here's an MR notice. We see a hyperintense clot within the hepatic vein here, on the right hepatic vein. There's also hyperintensity centrally, which is typical. Notice the intrahepatic shunting occurring to the hepatic vein within the caudate lobe. And keep in mind that the level of obstruction is the suprahepatic IVC. The caudate lobe is not going to bail out the liver. All right, differentials, diffuse hepatic metastases. This is a distinct entity. If you see multiple lesions throughout the liver, do not use the term diffuse liver disease because that, this is something different. These patients, you don't actually see focal lesions because every acre of liver is involved with tumors. Most commonly seen with lung cancer. You can also see it with breast cancer and melanoma. And by the way, if you could ask the following question, what's the most common mass of the spleen? What's the spleen, pancreas, um, the, uh, the kidneys, or perhaps the gallbladder. These are the things for lung, breast, and melanoma. The other one I would throw into the, to the pancreas is what Eric already showed in that, is uh, renal cell carcinoma of the pancreas. And there were several cases in the boards last year of renal cell of the pancreas. And here's a case of diffuse liver disease. Where are the, where are the focal lesions? You can't see them. This patient had uh, chemotherapy and actually got much better. All right, let's finish with the spleen. The spleen tends to get much, not much respect, kind of a rocky nature field of the abdomen and pelvis. And that's because there's not a whole lot of interesting things that happen in the spleen. Uh, but trauma, we often see uh, the same type of things we see in the liver contusion, lacerations, fractures, subcapsular hematomas. If you see a clot around the spleen, we call it a sentinel clot sign. And uh, that often is associated with uh, trauma there or elsewhere, say to the kidney or to the adrenal gland the tail of the pancreas. And with splenic trauma, they often have hemoparchnia. As I mentioned earlier, there's poor correlation between the findings and clinical outcomes. So again, we do not grade the spleen, and you can tell them the exam that I said so. All right, this is the normal arterial phase. You get these waves of enhancement. Don't fall for that. That's a normal pattern. And uh, some people believe, believe it's red pulp, white pulp. All the people believe that's not the case. It's actually some, something to do with the speed of flow to the liver, to the spleen. Here's an unenhanced CT. Notice that the clot is hyperdense to the spleen, but post contrast, it doesn't look anything like it's hyperdense, hyperdense at all. Notice that there's some hyperdensity within it, but it can be quite different. Here's a patient that had a very, notice they're always ugly CTs, right? A very thin rim of blood around, but it was relatively stable. I let this patient go home. You remember this phenomenon of delayed rupture of the spleen, and what happens is they look hemodynamically stable, they look fine, they go home and they show up four days later in the ER like this, but basically hypotensive and a belly full of blood. So this is a real phenomenon, delayed rupture of the spleen. And often when you go back, even if it was called normal the first time, you find a couple little dots in the spleen that perhaps explain why they had a delayed rupture. Here's a patient with active extravasation. You don't want to miss these, and they're pretty easy. These will either be go to the operating room or they can be analyzed. One other point about splenic trauma, I've been bitten before, where the spleen doesn't enhance. And you figure the patient probably has an infarcted spleen, but remember when you have trauma, both of the liver and spleen have hypoperfusion, and they dump a lot of blood into the systemic circulation to maintain your blood pressure. So maybe simply hypoperfusion of the spleen, that once they're reperfused and once they're, they're hydrated, that the spleen will be completely normal. It's not an infarction. It's simply a transient phenomenon of hypo hypoperfusion. Infarcts are pretty common, as you know, usually from embolic disease, well, through the splenic artery, sometimes it's a case like carcinoma. There's cardiac problems. You can get thrombosis in hypercoagulable states, some iatrogenic causes. Now, splenic vein thrombosis, I'm not actually sure that you can get splenic infarction from splenic vein thrombosis. I would probably not include that in the differential. I've never seen that proven. Here's a patient with some capsular perfusion, otherwise a, a large area of geographic hypoperfusion with infarction. Notice there is definitely a body disease because there's a, a mycotic aneurysm of the hepatic artery associated with, with the infarction of the liver. This is a recent case where the patient has hypo-enhancing hypo areas in the liver. This infarction happens very uncommonly in the liver. And the reason the liver infarcted, notice the spleen also has areas of infarction. You can see here, hypoperfused areas. And notice that the kidneys also
also in hyperperfusion areas. So what this says is a patient has embolic disease superimposed on hypovolemia, so they get infarction of all these. All right, neoplasms of the spleen. First of all, cysts. If you see a cyst in the spleen, do not think of an epithelial cyst or a, or a hereditary cyst, because they only occur 20% of the time. The remaining 80% are post-traumatic cysts or post-infectious cysts, all right? Usually post-traumatic. They may have some blood in them, they may not. They may just look like simple cysts. So if you see a cyst in the spleen, think post-traumatic first. There are some rare things like cystic lymphangiomas that will look cystic as well. There are some solid neoplasms, typically hemangiomas, and other vascular tumors. Most of the solid the tumors in the spleen are vascular malignancies, angiomas, the literal cell angiomas, hemangiomas, and other types of angiomas, hemangiosarcomas. There are a few hematomas as well. Here's a densely calcified cyst. This is a post-traumatic cyst in the spleen. This one you wouldn't call a simple cyst. And here's a patient with both liver and splenic hemangiomas. Now, the features of a splenic hemangioma can look like a liver hemangioma, but they're typically non-classical. In other words, they may hyperenhance, but they don't often show that peripheral nodes or enhancement pattern that we depend upon for hemangiomas in the spleen. Here's some more angiomas. These are literal cell angiomas. But just keep in mind, most hyperenhances in the spleen are going to be some form of angioma. All right, now what about malignant solid neoplasms? And these are either primary hemangiosarcomas, lymphoma, or metastases. Lymphoma, these are typically hypo-enhancing lesions. And keep in mind that if the spleen is enlarged, I say this very emphatically, uh, if the spleen is enlarged in a patient with lymphoma, it does not mean they have splenic lymphoma. In fact, they only have splenic lymphoma about 20% of the time. The rest of the time, the spleen is enlarged for reactive reasons, not because there's lymphoma cells within the spleen. Metastatic lesion, again, the big three, one breast and melanoma. Keep those in mind. Diffuse liver disease, and also for mess of the kidneys. Here's a case with some round balls in the spleen. These are very soft tumors within the spleen. This is melanoma. This is the lymphoma. Here's another one, kind of a cauliflower. Hyler tumor, hyler masses, as well as parenchymal masses. Parenchymal masses. Here's another one. This one actually has spontaneous hemorrhage, and that's a well-known phenomenon. Spontaneous rupture of the spleen in the presence of lymphoma. There's also blood around the spleen in addition to the lymphoma cells. All right, let's take a break. For about just one or two minutes, stand up and stretch, and then we'll look at the unknown cases. Thank you.
you just going to stay in here, or are you going to do the small? I don't know. Yeah, I think there's like, uh, they have all these out there. Give you my overview on what you're likely to see in the board. So, so you basically only have about uh, the, the entire session is about 25 minutes, and I try to encourage the examiners to get to as many cases as possible. Um, they give you 15 cases per session. It's very difficult to show 15 cases in 20 to 25 minutes. If you get through 10 cases, you're doing well. How many cases? Probably about five of them will be variant cases. About four to five of them will be will be CTs, and you probably, you might get one MR, but almost all the MRs are both and liver lesions. All right, there are not many other MRs. And yeah, so that's kind of my capsule of the, uh, the board. All right, here's the first case, and uh, this particular patient has, um, take a second to look at it in the interest of time, and I'll show you what I, here's the first image. So the watershed area is at the ankle of water, not of the ligament of the trites. 
And that's uh, where we tend to see the difference between the foregut and the midgut. And because the mesentery is short in patients with a uh, malrotation, it's much easier for it to pivot on its axis, as opposed to a long mesentery that extends from the root of the SMA down to the cecum. But the cecum's up in the right upper quadrant, it doesn't have to go very far. This is uh, one of those things that you know or you don't. And um, there's uh, some areas of hyper enhancement about the, the uh, fissure for the ligament, but also the hand. We talked about this earlier about how these are areas where you can get focal fat deposition or focal sparing and otherwise diffuse fat deposition. And actually can occur for the same reasons that this, um, this is happening. What happens is that you see there's some collaterals here, some collateral veins here, here and there. And you see that phenomenon. You can know that something is happening in the chest. And what this is, is superior being a cable obstruction. Notice that there's a breast cancer metastasis to the median sinum with obstruction of the SVC. And as a result of that, blood has to get to the abdomen either through these um, internal mandrels. That tends to be one of the sources for the aberrant administration to this part of the liver. Or through parambilical collaterals. What happens is the vasovasorum about the obliterated umbilical ligament can actually open up with certain pressure phenomena and serve as a conduit for collateral flow. So it's this flow of the liver through apparent sources, either internal medical or apparent medical collaterals. You've probably seen this with nuclear medicine. You can see that as well, hyperintensities. What about this case here? This is um, very similar to what I talked about earlier with difficulty with liver getting, the blood getting out of the liver. Now, typically, when that's the case, the periphery of the liver is involved more than the, than the central portion of the liver. Well, when you see large distended hepatic veins, here's the right middle and left hepatic vein, you see the large IVC, you see the spidery appearance called the nutmeg liver. This is classic for passive hepatic congestion from right side of the congestive heart barrier. In this particular patient, there's a large pericardial effusion as a cause for passive congestion. Notice in the venous phase, um, this is not quite as striking. You see that the liver doesn't look quite as heterogeneous. If you did a narrow window, you see it. All right, so the nutmeg liver is the appearance because the hepatic veins are not able to drain the liver normally. There's several of these on the boards every year. All right, now there are not a lot of ERCPs. And typically, if there is an ERCP, it's a pancreas to visa. So if you don't know what it is, just guess the visa, you're probably going to be right. <laughs> don't tell them I told you that. Um, this is, a, this is um, an interesting case where there is some narrowing in the region of the common hepatic duct. And um, on the CT scan, we can see that there's a large gallstone somewhat impacted here in the neck of the gallbladder. At this point in time, there's a filiary set in place. But um, you can actually go back and see that gallstone subtly, probably from the back of it, it's easier to see than where I'm standing. And this is a case of, of Marizzi syndrome, where you have uh, obstruction of the biliary tree by a stone impacted in the neck of the gallbladder with associated inflammation. <coughs> Many of those, however, will drop out more on the in and out phase. And so even though the 
CT is not helpful, the MR may be helpful in those cases, but it may not. It may be that they both are unsuccessful because there's just not enough lipid within those. The enhancement pattern is somewhat variable. Most of them are, they're all solid, so they will enhance. And however, they tend to wash out a little bit uh, faster. What about this uh, renal lesion? Here's the, uh, the nephrographic phase. And we go back and take an unenhanced CT. And it's plus 50 Hounsfield units. And then post contrast, it's plus 58 Hounsfield units. You know I made these numbers up just to message it. But um, so this, is, this one, you know, in this particular case, it doesn't really matter. What the, what the enhancement is, because there's a mural nodule here that's enhancing a lot. So this is a cystic renal cell, and the cystic portion of the tumor will never enhance. It's hemorrhagic or proteinaceous, that's why it's high density. But that's not the more reason this is a worrisome lesion. This lesion is worrisome because of that mural nodule, that eccentric area of wall thickening within the cystic renal cell carcinoma. Look at the entire tumor, don't just entirely base your diagnosis on the a bit of enhancement. We use 10 Hounsfield units on multi-detector CT, perhaps that's too low. They tend to enhance a little bit more because it's um, still an enhancement phenomenon. But um, generally, we stick to that 10 pretty carefully. Here's a, a, a different uh, type of lesion. And Eric showed some of these. And for some reason, there's just a plethora of these on the boards. I think everybody sends these in because they're so fascinated by this new tumor that we didn't know anything about hybrid. <coughs> and here we see a cystic mass. And you know, the whole idea is to try to figure out what, differ what the differential you're looking for. In other words, if you can figure out if the differential is for a cystic renal lesion with a mural nodule, if you can figure that out, then the differential is pretty easy. So here you have a cystic mass in the pancreas. So the differential here is for a cystic neoplasm. And there aren't that many of them in the pancreas. Now this one is associated with fairly significant pancreatic ductal dilatation upstream. So either it's blocking the duct or it's pouring cystic fluid into the duct. And so you can see that the duct comes right up to the mass and is not really being blocked by that. In fact, downstream of it, I don't know how you can see it, it looked like downstream of the cyst, there was also some dilatation. So this is the side branch uh, intraductal papillary mucin producing tumor, IPMT. About uh, 70 or 80 percent of these are associated with pancreatic ductal dilatation. The majority of, of side, branch duct, uh, side branch IPMTs are in the uncinate process for some odd reason. But sometimes they're eccentric like this one, which tends to be high. And again, it's very difficult to find the tumor because they tend to be typo vascular and they don't hand enhance a lot. And about 40 percent of them will have that phenomenon where Useless materials pouring out the duct at your CP. All right, now there will be some plain films. Here's a, a normal film. And what else do we have here? Here is a uh, small bowel ball through. And here's the CT. Let's go back a couple. So in this particular um, image, what you can see is that there's uh, maybe a little bit of dilatation of the small bowel, but there's a lot of wall thickening. You almost call that like a thumbprint here. But, uh, maybe a, like a pinky, from, pinky print, not a thumbprint, because they're not very big. But clearly that is abnormal within a small bowel, and when you give contrast, however, they don't look like they're all that nodular at all. They look kind of like there's very featureless. Like for some reason, the mucosa is completely disrupted. In some areas, like here, it looks like there's more thumbprinting. There's a thumb print or module. Other areas are completely featureless. And then on the CT scan, there's diffuse circumferential wall thickening uh, throughout the small bowel. And this is a case of, uh, actually, I'll show you another case. It's a different patient. And this is more typical of what, uh, there are lots of these on the board as well. And this is a more typical appearance of a CT where you see a large tubular looking mass, has contrast meaning within the lumen of it. And the lumen itself is expanded. There you can see it. Um, you can see the lumen is aneurysm and dilated. These are both examples, someone on different ends of the spectrum of small bowel and pulmonary. One with circumferential wall thickening, but not a, a big mass and not with aneurysm and dilatation. And a more typical one where you have a big mass, tubular appearance, communicates with the lumen and has aneurysm and dilatation. Some of that's because they, the, the nerves are infiltrated, so they get dilated. They also may get some. 
some of the necrosis or ulceration can cause that palpitation. <laughs> this is, uh, you ought to know this case because we went over it a couple minutes ago in the last lecture. I'm very familiar with this diffusive fatty liver, but again, this always tends to provide an area of, uh, of confusion. So let me just go over it again. There's an area of sparing here. There's also some subcapsular sparing. And the reason for that is that this part of the liver is getting its venous supply, not from the portal vein, but from an aberrant source, in this case, typically from an aberrant gastric vein. In other words, there's a vein draining directly from the liver into this portion of the liver. All right, and that part of the liver is not getting any portal venous supply. So if something is absorbed in the small bowel that is not absorbed in the stomach, you can see why this part of the liver would have a different metabolic environment than the remainder of the liver. So they can occur around the falciform ligament, and internal mammary and paraveltal collaterals, around the hilum, typically from aberrant gastric collaterals or anomalies, or around the gallbladder fossa, typically from aberrant pericholocystic veins. And here, this one, from a different case, notice that we have an area of focal sparing here next to the left portal vein in a similar area. And here's another case where there's some sparing around the gallbladder. So all of these are from an aberrant venous drainage to the liver. And this one um, is, has all three. The pusteatosis with focal sparing in the typical areas, subcapsular, perihyder, and pericolocystic. Here's a liver tumor. And these are relatively rare, but there are a few of these floating around. Again, this looks like a multilocular cystic necroma. You might include a conicotic cyst in your differential diagnosis, but you also have to think of uh, the biliary cyst adenomas. Now, abscesses of any kind can be multilocular, but again, when they look so well circumscribed like this one here is, at least think of biliary cyst abnormal. Here's another one, and this one's a little bit confusing because it's encapsulated. You can see the capsule here, but it's pretty much unilocular. It doesn't look like the multilocular cystic necrosis that I've seen. So keep in mind that some of them are unilocular, although most of them are multilocular, as we already said. Here's a series of images. We see something unusual in the porta habitus. Here's the gallbladder here, and here's a large cystic mass. Question, is this a cystic neoplasm of the pancreas? We go through that differential. You can see that this is a type 1 colidocal cyst. It follows the course of the common bile duct. Type 1 are fusiform aneurysmal dilatation of the common bile duct. Type 2 are typically saccular. I remember most of the other ones, but they probably aren't that important to remember. They're, um, they do have a problem with uh, development of cholangiocarcinomas down the line, simply because they have sensitization of the mucosa by chronic cholangitis. So these patients are almost uniformly resected by doing a pancreatic or, or a palicogenoscopy. Now, believe it or not, this is an easy case, but this is one that the candidates tend to struggle with a lot. And the problem is, is that you're good at seeing things that are there, you're not good at things at seeing things that are not there, all right? And the problem here is that when you see these patients that have a diffusive fatty pancreas, you can't see it, right? You look at the liver and the spleen and the kidneys and the ribs, everything looks normal. And if you just happen to not uh, recognize the fact that the pancreas is the same density as all the retrocardial fat. Occasionally, they'll get lucky because they'll have a dilated and beaded pancreatic duct like this case here, where you see it all the way throughout the gland. And occasionally we'll have a dilated side branch that looks like a cyst or an intrapancreatic cyst. That's relatively common. Here's another case, uh, a little bit different because there's some sparing here downstream or the downstream portion of the gland. But upstream, you can see again fairly significant fatty atrophy as a gland in the patient with cystic fibrosis. So keep in mind, I'm sure that some of you will get this particular case. We'll look at that pancreas and look for that fat. Eric talked a little bit about this disease entity. And what basically what you see here is you see a splenic vein. You can see that there's some normal enhancing pancreatic parenchyma here. Here's the duty with the feeding tube in it. But this isn't really normal at all. This is not enhancing pancreas. It's way too big. Here's what the patient looked like a few weeks later. Now what this is, and I really make a big deal about differentiating between peripancreatic fat necrosis and glandular necrosis. And I like to use those terms. The pancreas is an area of non-enhancement or poor enhancement. Use that term glandular necrosis. And what this patient has almost near complete glandular necrosis, and over time that necrotic pancreas and peripancreatic fat and hemorrhage and all the inflammatory exudates that accumulate in that part of the, the pancreatic uh, gland 
liquefies over time. Remember, there's a lot of enzymes there at some point that help digest all those things. So this is liquefaction of pancreatic uh, glandular necrosis over time. The real setup for infection because basically it's a very rich culture medium of blood, like blood agar, and protonaceous material and bacteria absolutely go crazy when they get in that environment. This is a really nice case because um, I hope you recognize that the white kidney is missing. If you recognize that, then it makes your job a little bit easier. And you also look at the pancreas and there's some low density areas. And here is the arterial phase. And you see that uh, the left kidney looks pretty normal. There's an area, a cystic area here in the tail, and there's one there. Eric talked about following small pancreatic cysts, but when they're multiple like this, you probably are a little more aggressive at least in volume. And there's also a hyper enhancing mass here in the liver. And here's the venous phase. You can't really see that in the liver anymore. But you can see these multiple cystic areas in the pancreas. So patients that's had a right nephrectomy for renal cell carcinoma and has metastases to the liver, as well as multiple cysts in the pancreas. This is von Hippel Lindau. And uh, keep in mind that we get cysts and carcinomas in the pancreas, as well as cysts and carcinomas within the kidneys. <coughs> um, also, one of those cases, the tents are up, and, and um, the key thing here is the term soft. I don't know my resident. These tumors are very soft, they're roughly homogeneous, they don't enhance a whole lot. And you can see that there's a mass here. It's sit clearly, you know, this is an enhancing mass. I'm just going to tell you that here in the, in the kidney. And notice that also in the perineophoric space, in the retroperitoneum, there's some other nodules in that area. Now, there's only a couple things that I've seen that emphasize the perineophoric fat. One of them is melanoma, and the other is lymphoma. Here's another patient with a different, uh, a different, uh, different patient with the same thing. This is a very large, confluent, again, soft looking. Not terribly hyper-enhancing mass here in the retroperitoneum. It takes out a portion of the kidney because it's probably involved there and then it engulfs the kidney. And both of these are cases of lymphoma. And again, lymphoma gets soft nodular masses. The, the IFIP always teaches that there's no primary lymphoid tissue in the, lip, in the kidneys, so there's no primary renal lymphoma. If it's in the kidneys, it's there for hematogenous reasons, or it's directly invaded the kidney through the hilum or hilar adenopathy. But you can get hematogenous spread to both the kidney and the perinephric fat or direct invasion, as we see in this particular case. So again, that homogeneous, somewhat soft, but relatively well circumscribed tumor is typical for lymphoma, not only in the retroperitoneum, but also in the liver and in the spleen. Here's a patient that I hope you recognize as a, a, a large looking pancreatic head that's in distinct anteriorly because of inflammatory changes. There's calcifications, and I like to use the term chronic calcific pancreatitis and as opposed to just chronic pancreatitis. It's more descriptive. And in, in this area is there a hyper-enhancing focus. Now, the question often comes up, is that a hemorrhagic pseudocyst or a pseudocyst with hemorrhagic to it, or is it a pseudoaneurysm? You can basically look over time. Hemorrhagic pseudocysts will not enhance, whereas pseudoaneurysms will. You typically see them around the splenic artery or around the gastroduodenal artery. There's lots of arteries that supply the pancreas, so there's lots of culprits that can have a pseudoaneurysm. Here's a patient that has a small bowel follow through. And we have a few more images. This is uh, a little bit later. And one last four hour image. And these are the, the ones that, you, that uh, are somewhat tough. It used to be that the uh, examiners would have like a bunch of uh, like cases in the back that they could use if they didn't want to show the ones that they're given for that particular session because there's no overlap, technically no overlap from the eight sessions. And well, I, I know once that like Dean McGlinty showed all small bowel cases. He went through all these studies, all the exams and culpa and pulled out the small bowel cases. That's pretty pretty lame. I hope that, that doesn't happen to you. <laughs> but um, what you can see in this particular case is that there's some dilatation of the small bowel of the fuselum. Um, you can see that these folds uh, proximally are somewhat, uh, somewhat linear. And you can see also that um, there's some, as we see some flocculation of the barium. So there's that reversal of the fold pattern. There's some dilatation. There's some flocculation of the barium in the patient with celiac disease. 
All right, this is the last case. This is a patient uh, Eric talked about. This it has a small hyperarousing mass here in the pelvic pancreas, not associated with pancreatic ductal dilatation. It's a little cystic component. You can see on the T1-weighted image, it's hypo-intense on this fat suppressed T1. It's the area around uh, these very small high cell tumors. As Eric mentioned, the by far more of these are insulinomas. But for some reason, gastronomes tend to have these uh, little areas of cystic necrosis within them. They're almost always using them to do it in the well. And they're often much more malignant and they don't respond to treatment as well. So they're much more virulent than of course, gastronomes. All right, good luck, guys, and thank you very much for your attention.